Allora, buonasera a tutti. Questa è l'ultima eh, presentazione dell'anno, eh, dell'anno 2020, visto che poi ci sono sorprese già per domenica. Allora, stasera abbiamo qua con noi Roman Kazan, che ha una buona conoscenza, una profonda conoscenza del lago, perché come molti acquariofili ha iniziato da acquariofilo e poi si è trasferito là per andare a vedere come erano i pesci, quindi ha fatto numerosi viaggi. E quindi ci parlerà un po' delle sue esperienze con quello che i libri non presentano. Voglio dare anche un paio di avvisi del parroco per quanto riguarda l'IC. Allora, prima abbiamo spedito il bollettino, quindi è in viaggio. Sappiate che è arrivato prima in Olanda che in Italia, adesso vediamo a chi arriverà, però magari anche qualcosa in Germania arriverà, vedo Luca Zucchero che fa così con la testa. Eh, secondo, eh, abbiamo aperto da poco un gruppo nella pagina Facebook, quindi se qualcuno non l'ha ancora visto, eccetera, ci faccio un giro e si iscriva, perché c'è fermento e altro, oltre a tutto il resto. Quindi adesso io lascerei eh, andare Roman e possiamo iniziare, va bene? Roman, you can start, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for introduction. As you could have seen, I was trying to use this Google translation to translate what you were saying in Italian into English uh, with limited success. Um, but again, um, let me welcome all of you to this interactive event i am not saying exclusively lesson because I would like to be this interactive. I will be touching uh, several subjects uh, about Lake Malawi, which I believe um, are not well covered in the books and you can really read about those in the books. And uh, these subjects will be These subjects will be um, um, uh, divided into several groups. I will cover one group by about five minutes. And uh, I would like to encourage you to ask questions in chat. You can ask questions in Italian because I can copy them and translate them for me into English using Google, and that works well, for, uh, works well for me. And after each subject, um, I will try to answer questions and then we will move on to another subject. Uh, first subject would be the, um, uh, the way of catching fish on Lake Malawi side. Um, i will watch the presentation given to you by Mark Thomas about how he catches the things and transports them over Tanzania. I believe that uh, the way of transporting fish through Malawi is different enough to be mentioned and compared because I was aware of the fact that live fish, the wild fish, is interesting subject in Italy. So I'd like to cover this one first. As you can see on the map, there is one big and huge difference in between Tanzanian based catches and Malavian based catches. And that difference, that difference is a distance from the lake towards the port or towards the base from where the fish is being shipped internationally. As you can see for Tanzanian catches, there is a distance which needs to be covered where fish is going from Lake Malawi to Dar es Salaam, which is the export, the airport, and it's about 800 kilometers or 15 hours uh, of, of journey, during which the fish is 
typically housed in those thousand liter tanks. They don't have a water changed and they come through that journey. They arrive to Dar es Salaam in the place. And then they are being taken care of, change the water and, and being um, uh, conditioned. Obviously in Dar es Salaam, they are not getting the, Mal the Lake Malawi water as a water change. This should also serve as an inspiration for debates over the water. Sometimes people put too much attention on the quality of water as far as the parameters of hardness, calcium hardness, salts, and so on. Now, if you consider that whatever water sources they can get in Dar es Salaam, it's probably some rainwater, maybe some well water. It's definitely by the ocean. Maybe some salts are in there, but for sure, for sure the water in Dar es Salaam is very much different from Lake Malawi, which obviously introduces some level of stress for fish. And now we may ask question, how important this stress is for the fish. Now, given the fact that the fish is coming from Dar es Salaam and Tanzania quite okay, maybe the ultimate answer about what importance the water has for our fish is rather absence of um, NO2, not O2, but NO2, yes. And absence of different organics rather than specific water parameters like hardness, like certain salt levels. Now, if you compare the um, um, live catch on Malavian side, these are typically catch on the lake side and then transported to the base uh, down near Lilongwe. That's the base of Red Zebra Company, who is like a biggest exporter of live fish from, from Malawi. I would say Red Zebra, but it's like a steward grant company. The official abbreviation is SGM, uh, but most of the time there are like a common synonyms, Red Zebra and SGM. Now, the, um, um, as you can see the Malavian coast from north to south is being covered mostly on water level, meaning that, and the next pictures will show this, how the fish is being taken care of during the, um, during the transport. I'm also aware of that Red Zebra has external teams which, catches, which catch the fish up north. And I believe from Nakata Bay, they transport them by um, by minibuses, by, uh, by car, because it's just so much faster. What is also interesting to see is how the divers catch the fish. So let me, uh, go well before then uh, just to finish the the journey once the fish reaches a red zebra company the sgm down by lilongwe the fish is being conditioned on lakeside in malavian water so unlike in dar es salaam 
where they have whatever water flows through the pipes of Dar es Salaam, and maybe desalinization plants, I don't know. Um, in the Malavian side, they get real Malavian water for that conditioning. And from there, from Red Zebra, when the export time comes, they are being packed under oxygen and then transported to airport, which is about one and a half hour from the coast, and then brought onto the plane and shipped through the commercial routes all over the world. So let me show you how the fish is being catched uh, in the water, because I don't believe that too many videos and pictures have been shown. You may have seen certain videos where divers using oxygen or air tanks um, and some nets are carefully picking up fish one after each another and putting them into nets, in putting them into nests, yes. Well, after I found how Malavian divers are using their equipment, it was quite a shocker for me as a diver. So let me jump into it. So first of all, the commercial divers, they don't use air tanks. Their air tank is that little thing in the middle of that little boat, which is called compressor. And there they have also the air tank, like a buffer, which they keep at 100 PSI, which is their primary stage. Our V divers, Okay, hang on, I lost the translation. Oh, sorry. Okay, so the uh, diver's equipment is that little box in a frame on that little boat, which houses the compressor and the ballast tank. From the ballast tank, there are hoses, which are very long. Imagine like 50 meters, maybe 100 meters hose, through which the divers are connected to this compressor, which serves as their sort of primary stage. To explain this, we as a divers have cylinder on our back, which is like a 200 PSI. That's the pressure of the air. On that cylinder, we have a reduction, which reduces the pressure of the air. So that our secondary stage, the things which we have in our mouth, can handle this and we can breathe the air. For the uh, commercial divers in Malawi, they are connecting, they are connected to the primary stage through the 100 meter long hose. And as you can see on this picture, you can see this hose hopefully coming right behind the boat, right? Um, every, every morning, every morning when the divers will set on the catching trip at the location, before they reach the location, the hose is being left from the boat where is neatly covered during the night and being straightened out.
Tomaso, what's the quality of video? Is it or that? I think it's okay. Yes, it's a little slow, but okay. Oh, you know what? Uh, let me see whether. Yeah, okay, I'll try to do this through the optimize. Okay. I didn't set up, I didn't set up optimized settings. So I'll, I'll run it again and you tell me whether it's better. The quality is lower, but the video is better. The velocity is better. Okay. So, so the guy in the small boat is uh, straightening up the ropes. You can see the two ropes here because the compressor will serve two divers on the diving um, day. Now, now when the divers will get set on the water, they will get those uh, second stages connected to those hoses into their mouth and they will dive into the water. The visibility in the water is not always perfect. I didn't adjust this video in any way. So you can see when the water is shitty, hopefully it did translate it well, translate it well. Uh, so when the water is not clean, it's 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 in, it's uh, challenging to see. So this is exactly what I saw when I was down below, and I was looking for the divers, which were trying to catch at that point some. Situkara mori or dolphins. Now the camera finally like a got focus, but you see two divers which are trying to catch the fish. And in the next few seconds, you are going to see one of the main reasons why some fish will not make it from the lake. Look at the top of the barrel. You can see that the fish is quite under some stress because all of a sudden they are being caught in an environment which they don't know. And as we know, the stress kills. That's why some fish will not make it because some fish are more susceptible to stress, to stress than the others. Roman, uh, I just shoot you a question. I, I hope you have your own uh, air bottle while you're filming this and you're not attached to, to the same system. <laughs> Funny question. Yes, I do have my own bottle. Um, so far, I was diving only one bottle. And because when we dive, we film and we are mostly alone, which is very dangerous. That's something that divers never should do. And so recently I upgraded my equipment to two bottles set up where I have them side mounted with me and uh, I have redundant supply of, of the air. Redundant supply of the air, of the air not earth. Yeah, that's that's smart. <laughs> yeah. uh, believe me, um, 
Oh, no, not I. You believe me, please. When I'm at 35, 40 meters depth at single cylinder, I don't have good feelings. At the same time, as you will see at the end of the lesson, it's totally worth it. But again, it's not something that one should do. How far is the first uh, decomp chamber? Uh, first decompressed chamber, maybe. I think South Africa. Yeah. South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. Not even in Dar with all no, the marine no. diving? No. Okay. The nearest is in South Africa. That's why they didn't go deeper than 10 meters. <laughs> it's, uh, I understand my doings over the past like uh, uh, visits as quite danger. However, I was managing the risks within my abilities and understandings of how things go, I know I know I can surface from like 20 meters if things will go wrong. And that's like, a, um, I have to act quickly, but from 30 meters, 35, 40 meters, where you can really see, if you are lucky, the big fish. Um, there is no way to, to go out if, if something goes wrong. So I was relying in, on my new equipment and on the fact that we are diving warm waters, which prevent certain cer certain malfunctions to happen but enough of, of that let's let's focus on the catching catching not kitchen catching not kitchen sulla cattura non la cucina okay um so one Once the fish is out, if they are caught in like a lower depth, like a, or higher depths, or simply not not as low, then they are being to surface immediately, and they are housed in those uh, same barrels, right? And in those barrels, barrels, barrels. Barrel. Barrels, yes. So in those barrels, they are being brought onto the big boat for transport. But before the boat will set off, it always takes a few hours. So they stay in the water, a little bit submerged, um, so the fish can have a fresh water. Roman, are they are, are them uh, SMG divers? Yes, these are, as I believe, uh, the core SMG divers because they went from us and David know them, knows them. David knows okay. them. Um, this was trip to East Coast, Chiofu, very short distance. Okay. Thanks. But as I mentioned, they also have external divers teams which are operating up north and they are bringing them fish. Yes. Yes, I know in Kata Bay and Likoma. Yes. And she's more, yeah. Okay, thanks. And of course, after each dive, the uh, ropes have to be carefully put on board and being stowed.
Now, now this was uh, a catching fish on East Coast, and it took about three days or four days while we were there. So once the fish were caught into those barrels, those barrels were being put into place on specific location and being tied to the ground by, uh, by a weight. At that location, they were held up until they were picked up on the day of departure. Sorry, Roman. It's Andrea speaking. Is there a, there is a, a question from uh, Professor Leandro Souza from Altamira, who is uh, watching the, your presentation, and he asks if uh, fish get swim bladder inflated when brought from deeper places. Yeah. Copadicrum is Gertsi. Wrong translation, Gertsi, Tommaso, if you can say Gertsi. Yeah, it's Gertsi with two E's. Copadicrum is Gertsi. So for some fish, it's very difficult to be caught and transported live back to base. This is, for example, a catch of Coparichromis gertsi from, I believe the location name was Maloma, it's south of Chiofu, not Chiofu, Chiofu, C-H-I-O-F-U, uh, Bay. Nice, it can do spelling. Um, when they catch the fish in lower depths, and I'm myself amazed that on that rope, they are able to go to 30 meters, 40 meters, and they are able to control ascent. I have a computer on my wrist, which controls ascent. They don't. They only have experience and feeling, but they do catch fish in those slower depths. And when they do that, the fish is being transported to about 10 meters water depth and being left overnight or even two days in there. So people who are catching fish are well aware of the challenges which fish can get during rapid resurfacing. And therefore, they accommodate the fish catch for that. However, as I believe, I believe that those Gertsi, Copa de Chromesis, they didn't make it because of insufficient accommodation, but I believe they are more prone to stress. They were pulled out of barrels on the road and they were distributed across different barrels and yet they were maybe only fish who didn't make it. So maybe, maybe a combination of accommodation time length and also stress because remember these fish used to live in 20 meters depth, 30 meters depth 
And at those depths, there is very little traffic. While in the barrels, they are with other fish, very disturbed in close environment. And I believe this is a crucial point in a stress which fish is facing. Sorry, Roman, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I want to ask you what are uh, the genus and uh, species that, are, that, uh, that have the highest uh, um, mortal percentage during the catching process? I would say the... Um... And I was, uh, I, I think this is a similar to what I've heard from Tanganyika location. A friend of mine, he recently took over uh, CJ catching operations from Germany, CJ from Germany uh, in Tanganyika. And he was explained to me that when they transport trophosis, uh, the big carp fish, what they name the uh, frontosas? Not process, frontosa. Yes. Okay. So when they export those, they don't have almost no death. However, they also have those white, an interesting fairy tail fish, and they have a lot of deaths. So I believe all the fish which lives like a below 20 meters level, primarily, they are more susceptible to stress than some bunas who live on the rocks in five, 10 meters, 15 meters, among other fish. And they are used to like a lot of movement, a lot of like interactions. Not that they would be fighting together because they almost never do fight. They have a lot of room to escape, but because they have simply, they are used to, to traffic. While the other fish which lives, which live down below, they are used more to quiet environment. Sad English. They are used to more quiet environment. And therefore, maybe a different level of arrangement and handling must be applied. Obviously, the people who are catching the fish and transporting them, for them it's nothing. It's like catching the chicken somewhere. You know, there is no attach, I mean, no reason to investigate that much. It's a job for them. Exactly. According to uh, you have just said, uh, um, I think that uh, Letrinops and uh, Copadibromis species uh, are, uh, and Trimethychromis, I guess, uh, are uh, the one with the highest mortality, I guess. I think I would agree with this because from what I have seen, where they live and how they live, it's a more uniform environment for them. Latrinopsis, for example, they are living on a sandy parts, sandy areas. And therefore their traffic, and if you see how they move across the sand, in those 20 meters, 15 meters, 
um, they are very fast. Like they would be escaping something. They are also very skittish in the in the aquarium hobby. When you try to catch them with uh, with a net, uh, they are very difficult to, to catch. Yes. So I believe that for us aquarists, people who keep the fish in aquariums, though these findings are very important in order to understand the fish we see or we, we have. But naturally, people who are actually catching the fish, there is no reason for them to really care. And then the question is, or maybe some suggestions for the future is, to pay more attention to transfer of that knowledge how, pe how the fish lives into, the, uh, into our rooms, into our living rooms. Because then we would not be hearing advices like have group of fish of 20 to fight aggression and these kinds of nonsenses because that's not how the fish lives in this the is no nature this is no nature exactly this is, this no is only a display aquarium that we can uh, easily watch on computer or uh, on our phones for example if the time will allow I will use the computer features of this and show you, um, say, actually I have that video. Um, I have 16 liter, 1600 liter aquarium with the mixed haplochromines and Buna set up and species. And it's so calm, like I would be in the lake. So I believe if we would have even more knowledge about how the fish lives in the lake, which we can really see from the videos, still pictures will not do, then we can learn better about how the fish lives and make better community tanks. Obviously, for commercial breeding purposes, I would I always use um, comparison with chicken farms to multiply the protein cells. You don't need perfect environment. The DNA still works, and if we can give the small fry. the conditions which they can get in the lakes. So for example, for we see 10 milomos or some other fish opportunity to put their mouth to work, then there is no reason why we should not see big lips out of these fish, right? But let's say this subject is more complex. So there is no room for it now. I want to ask you the last question. And uh, I'd seen your tank in uh, an Italian group, uh, Malawi Italia, uh, in which you showed your tank. And uh, I want to ask you, how do you feed a mixed tank with uh, both bunas and hubs? I am <clears throat> I'm using exclusively the um, pellets um, from what's the name? You know, that's dementia. Not from dementia. I'm dementia. Um, 
New Spectrum, Spectrum. New Life Spectrum. Yeah, New Life Spectrum, NLS. And uh, right now, actually, I am, I am demoing or I am making proof of concept. Hang on. Okay. And right now, I'm actually working and, and, and making proof of concept for a new feeder. I call it gravity feeder or a venturi feeder. Let me show you the video. Can I? Hang on. Let's see. Okay, how do I stop the video playing? Okay, hang on. So if you can see in a right top corner, how do I stop it playing on this way? So in a right top corner, um, do you see this one? My mouse is yes, running yes. down it. So it's basically yes. eventually, I'm um, sorry. I lost my translation feed. So you translate. Can do the tra yeah, I can do the translation on this one. So Quindi lì in alto a destra c'è il suo uh, la sua mangiatoia automatica che ha inventato. So on uh, right uh, on on top of it uh, so you can see also the feeder, automatic feeder. Quella sopra è una mangiatoia yes, automatica normale. And then there is like a small shoot coming from that feeder towards the hole. Sì, poi c'è un, una sorta di scivolo che va al, al buco. And that's because um, there is a humidity coming out of that hole. So I have to keep feeder out of the humidity. E questo lo fa per tenere lontano il, la, la mangiatoia dall'umidità che sale dal buco. Se no si so through that shoot, at certain intervals, like at four times a day, the pellets are coming down and they are landing in that thing which you see in that blue. Sì, eh, quattro volte al giorno praticamente il mangime cade, va dallo scivolo e cade dentro quella specie di imbuto che penso sia una bottiglia rovesciata. And if you see under this, that transparent, which is milk, plastic milk bottle or part of it, sì, dice che la parte trasparente è una bottiglia di latte tagliata. So there is a tea element from piping. Sì, c'è un, un raccordo a tea. And there is a simple venturi-like device in it. And from the right there is a pipe which carries the current from the filter. Poi c'è un sistema venturi e quindi dal tubo che si vede sulla destra all'altro ingresso della T, non quello da sopra, ma quello da laterale, c'è il flusso dal filtro. So when the, um, uh, uh, when the pellets come down to the milk bottle, so to speak, they fall down and venturi effects sucks them in and put them into into the aquarium. I don't know whether you see me mirror or not, but simply into the aquarium. Sì, e, e dice che praticamente quando i pellet cadono lì nell'imbuto, poi per effetto venturi vengono buttati eh, nell'acquario dalla corrente. And through that, I'm getting dispersion of the food. E grazie a questo il, il cibo si, si diffonde in tutta la vasca. Like, like in the nature. Un po' come succede in natura. 
Because in the nature, whether you see fish big or small, perché in natura sia pesci grandi che piccoli, they never get eat big chunks of food. E, I pesci sia grandi che piccoli in natura non mangiano mai pezzi grossi di cibo. Big fish or small, they always fish on small plankton, on small particles. Tutti, anche i pesci grossi, mangiano sempre plankton o comunque particelle piccole. And because in general, fish in aquarium have abundance of food. E siccome in acquario chiaramente c'è molto cibo, molto più abbondante che in natura. We do not risk uh, starvation of bigger fish. Non, non c'è pericolo che i pesci anche più grandi si, si insomma, muoiano di fame o comunque abbiano delle carenze nutrizionali. Also smaller fish is getting fed and because smaller fish is more lively e anche i pesci più piccoli vengono chiaramente restano a alimentarsi e più piccolo il pesce di solito più è vive, vivace. If they would feed from the surface se, se andassero in, in, sulla superficie a mangiare they would get overfed because simply they will get to food first and they will get most of it sì, sarebbero chiaramente sono i più veloci, più vivaci se, se il cibo fosse tutto sulla superficie mangerebbero tutto i pesci più piccoli che sono quelli anche che ne hanno meno bisogno e sarebbero sovralimentati but if you get food dispersed like this then each fish has similar conditions in order to get some food. Sì, invece se lo disperdi con questo sistema che ci ha appena raccontato, eh, tutti i pesci praticamente hanno le stesse chance di, di arrivare al cibo. Plus, a lot of food will end up in the sand. E in più un sacco di cibo finirà sulla, sulla sabbia, sul fondo. So bigger haps, they tend to uh, filter, go through the sand, While we know the Mbunas, they don't do it quite well. E così anche gli apps più grandi che vanno a cercare il cibo specie sul fondo e sifonando la sabbia eh, si alimentano meglio rispetto anche agli Mbuna che invece lo fanno, non si forano, non vanno a mangiare sulla sabbia. So I am, uh, uh, before I use this, I am testing this for about two months now. Adesso è un paio di mesi che sta facendo le prove su questo approccio. So before then I, I had uh, those pellets coming down uh, through the chute, through the hole, on the surface. And there you can see behind that um, bottle, you can see the circulation pump, which was um, being used for dispersion. Sì, e prima di usare questo sistema praticamente aveva lo stesso sistema ma senza la parte venturi, quindi eh, c'era la mangiatoia che faceva cadere i pellet, però davanti alla, alla pompa di movimento che vedete lì sulla destra sopra il sistema venturi. But because some um, pellets, some types of pellets, they float. Um, also, uh, I'm testing this with the uh, flakes, which works wonderfully with this one, but flakes also float first. So that's why I, I was thinking what to do better in this. Roman? Yes. Roman? Hey, uh, I am Luca Zuccaro, hi. Uh, but aren't you afraid that the feeder will break uh, and all the food would fall into the water? Or have you created a way to prevent this? Mm, I don't understand the feeder. Can you say it again, please? Yeah. Are you too, uh, afraid that the feeder will, will break? Also, the feeder is the... No, I mean, the, the current, the feeder, this one, is a, it's a beta version. Um, it's, it's basically piping, I think, 30, 30 millimeters size. And just put together, um, I use some plastic to make it more tight. And it just, it stays like this for about two months now. Obviously, um, so that's, that's answer the question if it breaks or not. It doesn't break. It's just perfect. 
Um, obviously, after using it, you will you will get into the issues like it accumulates the algae on top of on the surface, so it needs to be cleaned up basically every two three weeks because when there is an algae, the uh, pellets <laughs> and they will when they come down they they tend to stick to surfaces right. But that's just a normal debugging process. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there is no issue with it. Okay. Thank you very much, Ron. The plan with Ron? this one, uh, an original idea was to have it manufactured because a friend of mine, they have like a glass manufacturer, manufacture, they do glass things like pipes and stuff and do this all glass. Uh, but before I would commit them to do this, I wanted to figure out what's all, all, all aspects of using this one. If you think of this, um, and if you uh, really try to play with fish, and in, for example, you have latrinops, right? Or you have tiny latrinops and the circara mori. Imagine having biotope set up with a all sand, play, uh, all sand bo bottom with some small boulders maybe. And then you have uh, tiny latrinops, uh, frusicada and circara mori, for example, like in nature, right? You see them. I, you see them on my videos. Uh, Tal Nitrinops is digging the sand, and the Circara Mori is waiting, and then he picks up the leftovers, right? Um, and I saw it in my aquarium too. Um, now imagine that not only pellets can be fed, but also you can put there like a shrimps or some small, you know, frozen stuff, because once you put it into the water, it will unfreeze, and then once it Going, when it, once it comes down and being sucked into the venture effect, it will get dispersed into aquarium. Well, let's assume and let's think that you are not going to have dispersed into the aquarium, but you have pipe coming out of there towards the bottom, underneath the sand, and basically having fed into the sand. So you get in this setup, you get no food into the warm column, you get all food into the sand and you, 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 you let the cichlids, the tinolithinops, cichlidinops is all bottom dwelling cichlids, pick up the food like they are used to from the sand. Now, there are two benefits from this. One, you promote natural behavior. And second, you put their lips to work. And as more work they get, as bigger they get. So if you see the subsequent generations of VC tens and, and perhaps protomelasis or natusis, they have a smaller and smaller lips. Why? Because they have no use for those. Roman, wait, we must translate. Uh, Roman, wait, uh, wait. Uh, okay. Enea. Sì, allora ha, ha spiegato un po' che insomma tutta questa cosa del, del um, riassumo un po' perché insomma ha parlato per un attimo però eh, questa cosa della mangiatoia automatica che sparge il cibo in tutto l'acquario al posto che farlo concentrare sulla superficie eh, e così via aiuta anche chiaramente le specie che si ehm, alimentano più sul fondo come i teni o le trinops, eh, fossoro cromis eh, e questi altri eh, grandi cicli di sifonatori a eh, alimentarsi in maniera naturale quindi si promuove eh, da una parte il comportamento più naturale eh, e dall'altra si eh, diciamo permette a certi pesci di mantenere certe caratteristiche tipo le labbra molto eh, prominenti di alcuni blue followers che si vedono in natura anche se allevati eh, in acquario Uh, quindi F1, F2, F1000 uh, insomma bisogna mettere, metterle in condizione di uh, avere modo di utilizzare uh, queste loro parti del corpo altrimenti queste caratteristiche si perdono Roman, the chat uh, has a question for you about uh, the layout uh, of this tank in Italy we tend to use uh, high growth uh, and many rocks in order to create uh, uh, obstacles, uh, viewing obstacles between fishes. And uh, now we can see that you have uh, mostly an open space. And uh, we want to ask you why you use this type of layout. Um, it's again based on my impression 
from the lake and I will be um, stopping my speech so you can translate. Ok, eh, di nuovo è basato sulle sue osservazioni al lago. Um, in the lake, I don't see fish hiding from each other through obstacles. E lui nel lago non vede pesci che si nascondono l'uno dall'altro usando ostacoli visivi. In the lake, I see uh, males in their prime. Al lago vede i maschi dominanti. Defending some territory. And then based on the species. E i maschi dominanti che difendono i territori. E poi in base alla specie. Based on the species, they either defend the territory um, absolutely or relatively. E in base alla specie o difendono il territorio in maniera assoluta, quindi penso intenda anche ehm, in maniera eh, interspecifica oppure in maniera eh, solo intraspecifica. For example, based on my recollection, protomelasses are bitch. Eh, ad esempio, ho osservato da quel che si ricorda che i protomelas sono degli stronzi. Same for Copa di Cromes. La stessa cosa vale per i Copa di Cromes. Borley. I Borley. Canale. Copa di Cromes Borley. Um, to me, to my recollection, they defend their territory absolutely, meaning against all other fish. Questi, ad esempio, si ricorda che difendono il loro territorio non solo verso altri Portomelas e Copa di Cromes, ma verso tutte le specie. But then you have other cichlids, like Um, Trevavases or Fuelebornais or Zebras or um, other um, Metria Climas and they care about themselves not others Poi ci sono altre specie ho citato soprattutto degli Imbuna eh, la Beotrofeus sia Trevavase che Fuleborni eh, certi Zebra quindi Metria Climia, Mailandia o come li volete chiamare e loro invece si, si, si preoccupano solo del, dei loro conspecifici. So what you see in my tank is recollection of the lake and to the best of my knowledge and experience recreating environment. Sì, quindi quello che vedete nel, nel suo, nei suoi acquari è quello che lui si ricorda del lago e cerca di ricreare in vasca. Recreating environment which to my opinion eliminates or minimizes the stress. E lui cerca di creare degli ambienti in modo che uh, nella sua opinione chiaramente si minimizzi lo stress uh, per i pesci. See the reason why I have all vertical glass empty is not only the visual e poi eh, la cosa del de layout non è solo il, la cosa di creare barriere visive. Because I like blue, right? So I have blue back. Ma è anche perché a lui piace il blu e ha messo lo sfondo blu all'acquario. But also and mainly the back does not have a surface. Ma soprattutto perché il, il vetro dietro dell'acquario non, non crea una superficie, probabilmente che i pesci possono reclamare come loro. And if you see, observe your fish or fish from the lake on videos, they tend to defend the surface. E... Quello che vedi nei video al lago è che i, i pesci tendono a difendere appunto queste superfici, eh, diciamo, tangibili, non lo spazio indefinito. So when there is no surface, for example, on very popular are those 3D backgrounds. Sì, quindi se non c'è questa superficie come questi, questi background che lui usa molto The... neutri, The problem with 3D background is it gives fish surface to defend. Invece il problema di certi sfondi 3D è che 
invece questo, questo, questo tipo di background dà ai pesci modo di difendere nelle superfici all'interno dell'acquario. I have never seen in the lake many cichlids or many cichlids basically living by the vertical surfaces. E lui nel lago non ha mai visto tanti pesci che vivono vicino alle superfici verticali. Vertical surfaces, uh, basically a large rocks full of algae in like a smaller depths. And sometimes they are used or they are used by munas to feed. Sì, qualche volta cioè, eh, sono quelle a profondità minori e che gli muna usano per, per mangiare. But then in lake they have another 10 meters from the vertical surface to escape. Ma poi al lago quello che succede è che in realtà poi sopra ci sono altri 10 metri di acqua libera senza rocce, senza altre superfici che i pesci usano per scappare. They don't have this in aquarium. So base, because the aquarium tend to be rather shallow in a depth and also sì. shallow in a, in, a, in, a, in a tall dimension. Sì, they... eh... E al contrario di un acquario, chiaramente non avete 10 metri sopra la superficie, e anzi tendono ad essere abbastanza eh, bassi in termini di profondità e anche poco profondi in termini di profondità. By incorporating 3D backgrounds, we basically uh, are making their neutral zone smaller. E se, mettendo dei, dei, degli sfondi 3D, praticamente... Andiamo a togliergli questo spazio filtro neutrale che loro hanno nello spazio libero. In this aquarium, four years ago, I did have a beautiful 3D background from all three sides. E lui qualche anno fa aveva un, 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 uno sfondo 3D su tutti e tre i lati, diciamo, chiusi della vasca. After I came back from the lake, from my first visit, Did this background had to go out. E dopo I che had... in realtà è tornato dal suo primo viaggio al lago, ha tolto questi, questi sfondi 3D. I, I, I set up this layout and I saw a huge improvement in fish calmness. E ha visto che eh, la cosa funzionava molto meglio, i pesci erano molto più caldi. If I wouldn't see this myself in this aquarium, And if I wouldn't observe this in the nature and those two things connected together, I would never recommend this or be such a big advocate of this layout for aquariums. Sì, quindi se non avesse visto queste cose in natura, se non l'avesse provata nei suoi acquari, non, non sarebbe un, diciamo, uno sponsor così eh, forte per questi tipi di, di layout. In Roman, the chat uh, has also another question to you, mm -hmm. and uh, this is about uh, two genus uh, you talked about, and uh, you, you defined this genus as beach in uh, defending their territory, um, Copadicromis and Protomelas, and uh, the question is, um, uh, their attitude, their, their aggressive attitude is uh, related Uh, by um, well, the particular uh, attitude of the species tech, during the, the breeding period uh, uh, of building uh, um, breeding nests. For example, the Copadicromis treuanese uh, builds burrows uh, in uh, sand, for example, uh, you have said. Well, um, the thing is that um, males will always at some point get Uh, breeding ready. So while in nature, in the lake, they will defend their territory and move, scare away anybody else and they have place to escape. Once they do that in aquarium, there is no place to escape. At, at some point, at some year of their life, they will start to do that. And then there is a problem. If you see a lot of setups, a lot of aquariums, sort of people say they are working for them because the fish is young, they didn't reach their prime, 
you know, these hops, they will grow two, three, four years easily before they get like a mature and they start to show their, um, um, their yeah. altitude. Yeah, the altitude. So this needs to be taken care of. Uh, this needs to be um, like a considered um, that it, it really doesn't pay off to fight the nature. The nature is incorporated in these cichlids. For a while being, for a time being, these things, some things can work, even like having 10 males in aquarium, you know, but they will never work in the long term. So to me, when we talk about community tank, which should work in long term, um, to me, it needs to be set up from the get go from this day one as, as the tank going long term, including the species. To me, okay, thank you, Roman. Male, I'm sorry, go ahead with translation. Sì, allora ha detto che eh, chiaramente questi, queste specie che erano citate prima, in Coppa di Cromis e Protomelas, eh, il discorso che scacciano tutti non è tanto, eh, diciamo, legato al fatto che facciano nidi o così, eh, ma si vede anche in natura e il problema in acquario è che a un certo punto pesci, anche se li prendiamo giovani o quello che è, ehm, arriveranno in condizioni in cui si vorranno riprodurre e lì è qua, chiaramente, come sappiamo, è dove cominciano eh, le grane, perché in acquario chiaramente gli spazi per, di fuga per uh, tutti gli altri pesci sono eh, inevitabilmente più ristretti. E dice che un'app eh, grande, prima di magari dimostrare qual è il suo carattere, eh, arrivare in condizione ci mette magari 2, 3, 4 anni, eh, altri pesci ci mettono meno, però a un certo punto si arriverà. Eh, quindi certe cose che possono funzionare eh, sul breve e medio periodo, diciamo, è difficile che funzionino sul lungo periodo. Faceva l'esempio di mettere 10 maschi nella stessa vasca. I have seen and I have, I have had both Coparichromis borlei and Protomelas Taiwan reef, this was the one, in my aquarium. And I was observing these species in the lake as well. And the findings are the same. They are very strong protectors of the uh, territory. That's, that's what I can say. Sì, è la stessa cosa eh, che ho osservato sulla stessa specie Protomela Taiwan Reef, mi sembra che abbia detto, eh, che sia in acquario che in natura eh, ha osservato la stessa cosa, che sono eh, dei difensori molto tenaci del loro territorio eh, contro tutte le specie, non solo piccole specifiche. They did live in this 1600 liter tank and basically that Taiwan Reef was able to take over one third of the bottom easily and defend it against the Tyrannochromesis and everybody else. Coparichromis Borlai, he was fighting with, um, with um, um, oh, just about anybody. He was taking up, uh, who was the big boss back then? Um, I had to, I, I bred them very well. The uh, beautiful male, uh, blue and black. That's dementia, I'm saying. Yeah. Also, Gromis Rostratus. Yeah, Rostratus. I'm sorry. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, there were constant fights, um, and uh, the territories are simply huge. And therefore, um, I, 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 I can't recommend, for example, those into like a community tank too much because it's just so difficult to, to keep them. But other secrets work well. I can prove yeah. that what are you saying about. Uh, the Copa di Cromis Trevonese. I have uh, a little one like this, 10 centimeters and uh, a very bad attitude. When he's breathing he is, and defending his burrow is uh, truly aggressive. No one can uh, go near his, uh, his burrow. That's true, very true. Thank you, Roman. <laughs> Livio, how much time we have? Because you said we were limited. I'm okay to go all, I mean, I have no limit, you know, but I don't know about you guys. Uh, what's your time frame concerns? Allora, well, uh, we have got 20 minutes again. <laughs> and uh, we have, Roman, mm -hmm. do you hear me? 
Roman? Yes, we do, Olivia. Okay. Uh, Roman, Olivia was suggesting we, we have uh, about 20 minutes left. Okay. Um, so let me um, see what else we had uh, to cover. Oh, the, uh, okay. Well, just let, let's go quickly through the, how do you share? Um, I'll share the screens as before. Uh, translate and uh, uh, photos. Translate. Okay, share. I'll just go quickly uh, through. I mean, I will go quickly through the Red Zebra settings once the fish. Oh, here is one video to show the labor behind fish transport on the lake. Okay. So this is a time, um, what's it called? Not share, mm, but say a, a quick video of when there is a water change on the lake. Uh, you may remember Mark Thomas was showing you how they change the water in their environment. They have had on their boats those thousand liter water tanks, thousand liters water tanks. Yes. And they did have the um, um, fast pumps to change waters. And he sent mentioned that sometimes fish lives a month in those settings. I believe. Well, the logistics for every company and every locations may be different. The logistics, not larger states. So for <clears throat> what works for Red Zebra is those barrels because they are flexible and allow them to put them into the water to rest for a few hours, for example, if there is a new location. And therefore, I believe the fish has a good access to fresh water in between the locations. It also means they have a lot of manual labor during the transfer from, for example, East Coast to West Coast, because from some reason, they did not figure out the automation of water change. They flush the water through the bottom of the boat anyway So perhaps a fast pump would take care of this as well. But right now they do it manually because they figured this works the best for them. In result, the fish is getting fresh water from the lake during the transport from one coast to another. Here is how they rest the barrels, for example, at the stop at Namalenje Island on the way from the east coast to the base. To the base. 
It's Namalenje. N A M A L E N G. Oh, no, forget it. I just don't know. Namalenje. Yeah, we, we all know that. So okay. I think people can get it. Okay. So um, on, the, on, the, on the stop, they put barrels into the water. Fish girl get fresh water. And then it's only about 30 minutes ride back to the base. Once on the base, this is all famous. Look at the facilities, like a main sorting room, which everyone, which most people saw. Um, the fish gets sorted in those tanks. And once ready for export, if there is like an immediate export uh, requirement, they get packed um, and sent out to the airport. For those who, for those fish, for those fish who will not go to the airport and will stay in the facilities longer time. They have those concrete pools, which are fed with the water from the lake. As you can see, the facilities are quite massive and uh, they can incorporate a lot of fish. So in summary, I do believe that the fish from Malavian coast, Malavian coast, whatever, Uh, the fish from this coast, from Malawi, will get, no, <laughs> I don't know, fish from Malawi will get a little less stress than the fish being exported through Tanzania. However, I have received a lot of good fish from Tanzania, so take this as just example of a differences in fish catching and transport, but not any recommendation as to where the quality fish is coming from. There are more factors to this. Okay. Um, now, um, if you have still like 15 minutes, let's make a quick run through. Okay. Now let's make a quick run through, uh, through the locations. I will speed up that video. So don't worry. It's not going to be seven minutes. This. This is uh, Nakatenga Island. This is Chiofu Bay. Chiofu, you know Chiofu. Don't don't pay attention to the translation. This is border. Gome Rock, you can see the rock by my cursor. I believe that's why they call it Gome Rock. Uh, 
uh, Chio Fubei. Uh, this red zebra facilities. My cursor shows the fish house and the concrete pools are to the right. This is Zimbabwe rock. A Domve Island is in the back. To the left, I don't know if I mirrored or not, but simply to the left is Domve, to the right is Tambi West Island. This is Domve Island. This is Otter Island. And this is Mitande, famous or popular location for naming the fish, Mitande. But to me, it's all Tambi West because it's just a pile of rocks in between the Tambi West on the left. There is a tip of the Tambi West Island and the Cape McClear location or beaches on the right. So it's all one location, Tambi West, all zoo. Zoo. Those rocks get submerged um, during the high levels. This is the Harbor Bay down to the south. This is, I believe, Mako Kola. And uh, That's location, which you wouldn't think it's location, but it's like a reef, like a 10 meters below the surface. And there is a lot of like a, a lot of fish. This is Bodzulu Island. On the left, there is nothing. The fish is on the right. And on the far back side of the island, there is a crocodile, supposed to be. I, I've never been there, but they told me there was a crocodile. And this is Chiriam Baisi Island. And uh, that's by far the best location I've ever dove in Lake Malawi because the water was crystal clear and I saw wonderful fish. And so, Right now, I would show you the video from Chinyamwezi Island. And there is a footage which I never shown to anybody. And that's of the guy who you saw on the invitation. There is a story behind it. I bumped into him by accident because you don't see this fish in Lake Malawi. So let me show you how I bumped into this VC-10. So this is Chinyam Wazy Rock. We parked by the rock. This is Larry Johnson. And I started to descend. Now it's 25 meters, 26 meters. And I went down and down and down and here he was, right here. He, he is where I show my cursor. You can see his size and compare it with the uh, Sinotilapia, fully grown.
So although literature says they grow 20 centimeters, I say this one was 30. Not sterling, 30 centimeters. Or maybe more, but everything is bigger underwater. Hang on, I clicked the wrong button. So you can imagine how surprised he was when I literally landed on his back. He swam away a little bit and I thought I lost him. I lost him. So I went on to film the tilapia, I'm um, sorry, um, sinotilapia land. Because there are a lot of sinotilapias on the Chinian Vesey. I just, sinotilapias, they just, they okay. Just please understand the translation where it matters. And while I was filming the small fish, I bumped into him again. And I don't know how well you can see him. Look at my cursor. And look how calm he is and how calmly he moves. Every time I see him, even on video, I am speechless. Because you just don't see and get to film this kind of fish like ever. So with this, I hope that I um, finished at in time, Livio. Yes, uh, in time. Yes, uh, I speak in Italian. So, adesso per i saluti finali possiamo anche apparire tutto, tutti. Giusto, Andrea? Sì, benissimo. Grazie. Eh, magari Inessa glielo dici così lo spieghi meglio di me. Mm. Yes, now everybody is invited to turn on his video for uh, last words and, and thank you to Rowan. Yeah. Thank you guys for... Uh, no, thank you to you, eh, Roma, for your videos, beautiful videos. And uh, with Placidochromis Milomo is a beautiful uh, specimen, beautiful fish, yeah. Grazie di tutto and happy new year, eh, Roman. Thank you guys. I wish you happy new year. And if you will have desire to continue with some other subject, I'm open. Oh yes, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you, Roman. Thank happy you, Roman. new year. Happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy new year. Andrea, you. saluti tu 
finisce sì, e dia avvisi per man. domenica anche certo certo allora volevo avvisare eh, tutti quanti i partecipanti e i nostri amici che ci stanno seguendo che domenica 3 eh, eh, cominceremo il nuovo anno con una nuova presentazione sarà con noi Emiliano Spada e che ci presenterà eh, qualcosa di veramente interessante su antichità acquariosa no, no, no. quindi vi aspettiamo tutti quanti domenica prossima domenica 3 gennaio per la prima, prima del 2021 alle ore 17, alle 5 del pomeriggio. Bene, grazie a tutti per aver partecipato, grazie a Roman, grazie a tutti quanti e buone feste, buone feste. Grazie ciao. a tutti, buon anno. Grazie, ciao, 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 ciao,